Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to Grand Rounds. We'll go ahead and get started. It's a real privilege for me to introduce Dr. Christy Valentine, who certainly needs no introduction, is presented at Grand Rounds um, multiple times. He's a professor of medicine. He's chief of uh, cardiology and cardiovascular research at Baylor College of Medicine, director of cardiovascular disease prevention research, and for here at, at the Methodist Hospital, the co-director of lipid metabolism and atherosclerosis clinic. He's recognized nationally and internationally for his work in molecular genetics to better understand the role of inflammation and cell adhesion, and clinically has been very uh, involved and has been well-funded, including NIH funding and clinical research related to lipid and lipid metabolism. So he's really a, a national expert in, 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 in the update as it relates to lipid guidelines, and so it's a real privilege for us to have him here to, to present this topic. As always, Dr. Valentine, thank you. Thank you, Jerry, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here today. So it has been a very uh, interesting career to have gone into the field of, of lipids. Um, I was a cardiology fellow at Baylor uh, at that time with a lot of our training here at Methodist. And when I, when I finished up, I decided I wanted to do research in lipids and atherosclerosis, uh, which at the time, people were like, well, what is, what are you, why, why would you be doing that? Because it was really not mainstream of anything. The drugs weren't very good. It was usually using niacin and bodice as the questions. Uh, who, who in here has used niacin at, at three or four grams a day? Show of hands. Not a whole lot of hands go up. <clears throat> and as you, those of you who used it know that people didn't like taking it. Uh, the same thing if you were using 24 grams of cholestyramine or 30 grams of cholesterol. So you, clinics weren't very busy because you gave drugs that no one would take and they wouldn't come back. <laughs> so it's been interesting to go through the sets of guidelines. So in 1988 was the first set of guidelines and it came out the year after the first statin was approved. Uh, and this class of drugs changed the whole field. There were no outcomes in regards to clinical uh, events, just that it lowered LDL. In 1993, the second set of guidelines came out. And once again, there were no outcomes until 1994 when the 4 study came out. Uh, 2001, we had the third set of guidelines. At this time, we had a substantial amount of data. And, and in 2013, now it, it turns out if you look at all these guidelines, they've actually been consistently more intensive. And we'll get into some of the issues with the last set of guidelines of 2013. And it's because more and more data came out. And, and it's one thing if you look at the way trials are designed. So these are in guidelines that have been done. Guidelines have moved towards uh, it, look, using a high degree of evidence. And they want large randomized placebo-controlled trials with how hard outcomes. So who here has ever designed a, 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 a large placebo-controlled trial? So if you want to get hard outcomes, which would be non-fatal, fatal in my stroke, you're talking about studies that are going to be 10,000 people upwards. When's the last time somebody got an NIH trial funded for 10 to 20,000 people? Uh, it just doesn't happen. So what ends up happening, all the data was, came from statin trials. And the statin trials were paid for by sponsors who were pharmaceutical companies. And, and there's nothing evil about the process of trying to get a drug approved for an indication. But if you do that, what you're doing is comparing your drug to a placebo, and you're not testing a guideline, you're testing efficacy. Does the drug work in certain patient populations? Now, the data has been extremely impressive. Uh, we started off with a 4S study. People with very high cholesterol and heart disease, and you moved progressively to other studies, the people with moderately high cholesterol, and they were the high risk category. Then normal cholesterol. And then high, you had high cholesterol without heart disease. And finally, some studies were done where people who had very unimpressive cholesterols, they didn't have heart disease, but they had other factors, low HDL cholesterol and AFCAPs, <coughs> hypertension and ASCOT, high sensitivity CRP in Jupiter, diabetes and CARDS. And it, it ends up, for example, in Jupiter study was stopped early People were like, well, gee, that was so surprising. There was nothing surprising about it. 
the ASCOT study was done people with hypertension, and they used a atorvastatin, 10 milligrams. It also was positive after three years. So it, it's been interesting. It's actually been very consistent in regards to the data. And what's ended up happening is if you looked at the, at the data by this meta-analysis, the CCT collaboration, is that for every millimole, which is about 40 milligrams uh, for density or LDL reduction, you reduce events by 21 or 22 percent. Now, there's also a pretty good correlation between the percent reduction and the event reduction. We tend to look at this in terms of the absolute LDL reduction uh, for it. But if you looked at Jupiter by the percent reduction, you reduce LDL by, by 50 percent, you reduce events by about 50 percent. There was nothing surprising about it. So what's been interesting is that, so the drugs have worked across, as I said, a wide range of patients. They've worked across the, the spectrum of LDLs from low to high. <coughs> and they've worked, this is very sensitive, isn't it? And they've worked across the spectrum of risk from low risk to high risk patients. So statins have been an unusual class of drugs. They've worked in a very wide group of patients. Uh, they've consistently had benefit, and most likely the major reason is because they've had a very large effect on lowering LDL. We measure LDL cholesterol as a, it's the surrogate for LDL and atherogenic lipoproteins. Statins lower it, they, they lower LDL, they lower IDL, they lower VLDL, but everything with ApoB, all the ApoB particles are lowered by statins. So sensitive. Uh, so, <clears throat> there was an update, and it became a complicated process, initially started by the NIH, there was an evidentiary review. As I said, they only looked at uh, uh, RCTs with hard outcomes that were placebo controlled. So after, of all the thousands of studies, it was limited to a, large, a pretty small number of studies, around 60. Some people say, well, why don't you look at all of the evidence, not just a small bit of the evidence. But they basically, the goal was to come up with something fairly simple. And so they have some categories where there's clear benefit for statin therapy. So secondary prevention, people with diabetes who had LDLs between 70 to 89 and 40 to 75, LDLs over 190, and that category had probably the least data, but <clears throat> because there's never been RCTs and people with FH, uh, but there's enough information that they came up with a, a strong recommendation that in these people, you should use high intensity statin at a dose that's going to be lowering LDL of 50% or more. Uh, then they came up that in primary prevention, it's different. Uh, you use a risk equation if they had atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk of 7.5% uh, or more, then consider statin therapy. And with some clinical judgment, in certain people, you might go down to 5% with it. Uh, and that would be a moderate intensity or a high intensity statin, depending upon the individual. So, wow. What is a high intensity statin? And once again, they talked about a statin where you would be at a dose where you're trying to lower LDL by 50% or more. So that's a torvastatin statin, 40 or 80 or receive us at 20 or 40. Now, in regards to moderate intensity or low intensity therapy, all of the statins will get you there. So they gave specific doses and specific patient groups with a goal of trying to make this somewhat simpler for patient care. This thing is frustrating. Um, What's the risk of him? So, so Neil, I don't know. It's just uh, I guess it's your the advancer on the computer. Yeah, that's just too bad. Use the advancer on the computer. Okay. Now, let me get back to where we were here. Okay. Now, it, 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 there are common themes. Now, the, the big thing in the guidelines that was emphasized was really that there were no targets. They gave them a question: Is that what is the evidence for an LDL target? And as I said, the trials really weren't designed to test a target level achieved. They were designed to test efficacy of drugs versus a placebo. So there really wasn't any clear evidence of that, you know, 
an LDL of 70 versus 85 or 100. Now, it's unfortunate in some ways that that was the question that they chose to focus upon. You know, in all life, there's some politics. Uh, who, who gets to pick the question? Why was that the question that was looked at? To me, the biggest question is, why don't people take statins? And what can we do to make it better? That would be the biggest question, because we know the drugs work, and yet they're not used very widely. Uh, if that's the case, you may not come up with an answer that we should be giving everybody 80 milligrams right off the bat. So I think there's the issue of which question is picked. But basically, all of the guidelines are consistent in saying that if you've got established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you should be using high efficacy statins. That's ACCHA, uh, that's National Lipid Association. Uh, it ends up being Canadian guidelines, ESC guidelines. They're all consistent on this, this, this factor. Uh, and in fact, if you look at most of the aspects of the guidelines, there's more consistency Oh, yes. You want me standing? Is, there, is this supposed to be on video? Yeah, Does it's it okay. A difference? Okay, you get the slide. So, so there's more consistency than there is differences in the guidelines. Uh, now, the issue of targets starts to come into play is when do you use combination therapy? Uh, when do we add a second <coughs> agent? Uh, how do you deal with the patients who are having difficulty tolerating a high dose of statin? So. First of all, let's get clear, the ACC AHA guidelines do focus on reducing LDL cholesterol. They do recommend that everybody get follow-up lipids so you can know if they're having effective treatment. And in fact, for, for I mentioned there's, there's four treatment categories. This is talking about the people with high LDLs over 190. Maximal statin therapy might not be adequate to lower LDL cholesterol sufficiently to reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk in individuals with primary severe elevations of LDL cholesterol. In addition to a maximum tolerance dose of statin, non-statin cholesterol medications are often needed to lower LDL cholesterol to acceptable levels in these individuals. That is straight out of the guidelines. So people are saying, well, the guidelines say you, you never use combination therapies or you never add on drugs, you don't measure LDL. Unfortunately, uh, I remember uh, being interviewed by Gina Claude of the New York Times after the guidelines came out and she asked me, are you going to still be checking LDL? And I said, yes. And she said, well, you, are you using non-statin drugs? I said, yes, in certain situations. And so she wrote a thing that says, he's going to ignore the new guidelines. Uh, <laughs> I was surprised, uh, but that's the way it got spun uh, for it. And in fact, there's an algorithm that comes out and it says anticipated therapeutic response. And it says 50% or more reduction. Now we do have a problem in terms of judging that. When you see a patient, do you always know what their LDL level was before they got treated? And then unfortunately, you know, the difficult mathematical equation was, of, was it reduced by 50%. Uh, people don't like to do math in their head anymore uh, for it. So there is some arguments is, well, if, if, if you had our old of 100, you know, people might say since 98% of individuals have LDL cholesterol under 200 milligrams per deciliter, and if you were to get a 50% response, then they would all be under 100, right? So, you know, there, there was a lot of tension about why not leave the 100 in there uh, just to help clinicians and healthcare providers have at least a target, a number that they can say that probably they didn't get an anticipated response. Anyway, that debate fell through uh, with it. <laughs> so, but it says clinicians treating high risk patients who have a less anticipated response to statins, or, uh, who are unable to tolerate a less than recommended intensity of statin, or complete statin intolerant, may consider the addition of non statin cholesterol oral therapy. And then it gets some details in terms of who are these individuals, the high risk patients. So when it's come to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you go through what's the definition of that. Uh, people with high LDL, these are these high-risk individuals, and it says consider non-statin therapies for these people. Weigh risk and benefit, and hopefully there'll be some evidence for outcomes if you can choose one. Now that is not an uncommon situation. This is European data. 
But from the diocese, they did a registry of people with coronary disease after respiratory cardiovascular disease. And they found this was there that basically took the LDLs over 100. 47% uh, in Europe had that. But look how many had LDLs over 160 in red. Uh, so it's, it's not rare. It's a common thing that we see uh, for it. So the guidelines, clearly they talk about the intensity of their therapy depending upon the risk. There's not a specific LDL level or goal in prior guidelines. You do have LDL levels mentioned in defining three out of the four categories, including one category is by LDL over 190. And in addition, uh, for the decision process, that's for initiation of therapy and also assessing response to therapy, consideration of adding other drugs. So there's a clear role for non-statin therapies. There is a little bit of a challenge here, though. Uh, was Howard Rubin in here? Yeah, so Howard, I think there have been the question, what about, where do we go with, you know, if the, the, if the language isn't terribly clear in terms of when you use, and when would you use the second drug? How, what's, the, what's the algorithm for the process? Uh, there is a conceptual framework. We just had a think tank at the ACC that uh, Ken Bertrand here organized, that was part of. And one of the, the things we'll do is to be working on over the next few months is to come something, it's not a, be a new set of guidelines, but it will be more of an algorithm to help people in the process of doing what is reasonable. Uh, this is gonna have more with expert opinion uh, with it, but to something in terms of helping people go through this. So it's, it, it is recognized uh, that, you know, even with high dose statin, people continue to have events. There is residual risk. I'm gonna talk about the general concept of how could you reduce that risk, but we'll, and we'll finish up a little bit more about, you know, the, the thought of guidelines. Uh, so, how could you reduce the risk more? Well, uh, it's a complicated process, and if lipoproteins are important, but by the time you have an event, there's a lot more going on in here. And so you have the entire issue, you have to look, what is the biology of, of, of basically an uh, atherothrombotic event. And, and clearly you have the issues of plates and thrombosis. Uh, you have plaque rupture, uh, you have inflammation, like the proteins are playing a role in multiple aspects of this. But there's a lot of different potential targets and there are many trials ongoing. So one is a target like a protein metabolism and we'll talk about LDL, HDL, and triglycerides just a little bit with a focus on LDL. Targeting inflammation, there's some major trials ongoing uh, targeting inflammation, we're involved with the, uh, the, the Canto study, which is the anti one beta, there's the methotrexate study. Uh, also, obviously we are targeting for people who are smokers, but also lifestyle modification, although the data is not great on reducing weight. Uh, it's something that we feel is important. <coughs> Diabetes control, we have our first trial that actually shows that a, a new therapy, uh, STGL2 inhibitor actually reduced events, although they were not atherothrombotic events. Uh, it was really more heart failure reduction, uh, but there was a benefit cardiovascular. And more intensive blood pressure control. Uh, really big news, it's not published yet out of the SPRINT study, uh, that a target of 120 systolic blood pressure trial was stopped early by the DSMB with a mortality benefit. So that is huge news. So. I think our whole concepts of, of where we're going to be going in prevention are going back. But the two things that have really stood out over time have been blood pressure and LDL. And once again, we had a lot of controversies about blood pressure and there were some controversies about LDL, about lipids, but it really was because uh, there's not much about LDL. So let's get back towards the LDL story. And I think this has been something where molecular genetics as applied to epidemiology has been very insightful. Because what, what ends up happening is there are many genetic variants that influence the level of LDL cholesterol. These were GWAS studies, so these are using somewhat common SNPs. We've seen also in rare variants though with hereditary disorders. But so these, all of these genes influence the level of LDL. So they're all highly associated with small changes in LDL cholesterol. <coughs> and 
And they are also changes associated with the frequency of coronary heart disease in the same direction as LDL cholesterol, and in fact, a very close relationship. And it turns out that if you look at this data, I think, I think Brian Ferenc must leave out a couple of genes to make the graph look so good. Because uh, <laughs> nothing here looks this good uh, for it. Uh, but it's a strong association, and the fact is, it's steeper when you have lifelong reductions in LDL. But the data is very consistent for rare disorders and common genetic variants. If you have low LDL, you have less heart disease. High LDL, you have more heart disease. Uh, very strong. Now, HDL cholesterol is a very good biomarker for risk assessment. Uh, you know, I trained at UT Southwestern my last year of residency. I, we had to give this a, a grand rounds as residents, and I, I gave one on a patient with low levels of HDL. She had a level of like 18, and she was 40 years old and had an MI, and went, gave, gave this lecture, and I was very proud of myself. I thought I did a great job. And Joe Goldstein comes up, who later went on to win the Nobel Prize, and he said, Christy, he says that was a nice uh, review, he says, but he says, if I were you, I wouldn't really study HDL. Uh, he, said it's, he said, it's very complicated. <clears throat> the genetics are not very straightforward. The, the physiology is complicated. He says, it's just not a really good area to go into. Uh, he said, trust me, I've, I've, I've looked at this. Uh, that was 1987. So a few years later, uh, when it's 2012, a study comes out that, once again, same methodologies. Here are the genes that influence levels of HDL cholesterol. And uh, the, the gene that had the biggest impact was an endothelial lipase, LIPG, and it has no association with coronary heart disease, none. And this was going back to the rare hereditary disorders where there was uh, discrepancies. They didn't all have premature heart disease. It turns out that the only ones above the line are the ones who, the, the genes that are associated with HDL cholesterol, they're also associated with heart disease, and guess what? All of them, in addition, have an association with either, with either triglycerides or LDL. So it doesn't mean for sure that HDL is not involved, but what it means is it's very complicated, and clearly there are genetic mechanisms that alter levels of HDL cholesterol that have no impact on heart disease, which also means that drugs which target HDL might also have no impact on heart disease. Uh, with it. So it's, it's just, it's not a simple target. It's very complicated. So Goldstein was a smart guy. That's why he got the Nobel Prize and he gave good advice. Uh, so we talked about statins, azetamide. If you add azetamide, you might, and it's still a, 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 a public issue. So they took people and you have a placebo control study. The placebo group has an LDL of 70. The azetamide group has an LDL of 54. And people still say, why would you do this study where if you've got people on statins and they're only 70, well, who would add azetamide? <laughs> would any of you add azetamide to a patient who's on uh, 40 milligrams of simvastatin and their LDL is 70? Probably not many people. So it's a little bit of a, a, a study that's unusual in design. It was just a significant, and so now we have some outcomes data with azetamide that was not available when they came out with the guidelines. And if you look at it by heart events, it pretty much fits on the axis that uh, uh, beneficial, and it ends up, it's, it was beneficial, and if you look at the other part about harm, there was no increase in side effects. So, this, the, the treated patients got down to 54, that's really, even in looking at our, our RCTs are very, people are very well treating these large RCTs with the statins and everything else, but you know, it's very infrequent that people get down to LDLs in 50 uh, uh, range. Uh, and I mentioned that, in fact, it's very common that you have LDLs that are over 100, in fact, over 130, 160. Okay, so you still have this issue uh, of if you have a patient who's in a high risk category, when would you add the next agent? And how low should you go uh, with that? And what we're probably will be evolving is a way probably towards a concept, and I'll go into more of it here, but basically maybe the concept of a threshold rather than a target. 
So you, you've, you've got a patient, you've treated them. And it looks like lower is better. There's not necessarily a target, but there, there's a, there can be considered a level above which you still have risk that you feel is, depending upon the category of the patient, may be unacceptable. Uh, is that gonna be 70 or 100 or 130? But you can come up with some algorithms combining risk and an LDL level, which would sh identify patients who would have benefit by further LDL reductions. Okay, so where we stand on further, and, and, and ACC had mentioned this is an important area to get more data on the newer agents. So I'll, I'll go through quickly, uh, you know, we've LDL has been the focus for this, and the way statins work is they increase LDL receptor number by inhibition of HMG core reductase. Uh, what ends up happening is we've learned now uh, that PCSK9 uh, plays an important role where actually uh, it ends up targeting the other receptors of the lysosome. Uh, this has been a very rapidly evolving story in regards to how genetic data has led to a, a new therapy. So what is PCSK9, uh, proprotein, convertase, subtilisin, uh, texan type 9? So it's secreted protease, protomain, catalytic and C-terminal domain, mostly expressed in the liver, but it's in other tissues. Uh, and what ends up happening is uh, it binds to the LDL receptor, and it, it, it basically, uh, if it binds to the LDL receptor, the LDL receptor gets degraded. So this was first described uh, in a French family that appeared to have familial hypercrystal anemia, but they did not have mutations in the LDL receptor or ApoB, which are the two most common causes of FH. And through some good work, they uh, basically did some reverse genetics and they found that it was due to a mutation in PCSK9. Well, Helen Hobbs at UT Southwestern and, and Jonathan Cohen have a large study called the Dallas Heart Study, and, and she said, well, let's sequence in the tails, uh, so the high LDLs and the low LDLs, let's sequence PCSK9 along with a bunch of other genes and see what we find. And they found that there were variants associated with low levels of LDL cholesterol. So then she gives Eric Borwick a little call and said, let's have a look at this in the, the atherosclerosis community study, which Eric is, uh, does the DNA. We have all the samples here up on the seventh floor uh, at Methodist over at Baylor. We've got 1.2 million vials of plasma and serum, urine from multiple visits on 16,000 people, uh, four U.S. communities, African American, Caucasians. So what happened was that people who had these genetic variants. Uh, have lower levels of LDL cholesterol. This is data for African Americans, and then a big reduction in CHD for Caucasians. It was a little less impressive. The variant in, in Caucasians didn't make as big of an impact on LDL. So there was genetic data that, and this was a loss of function variant. So a loss of function variant, low LDL, that's heart disease. The gain of function variant, high LDL, premature heart disease. One other aspect of the story is that. Uh, so statins, as I said, they inhibit intracellular cholesterol production. And what that ends up doing, is, is there's a transcription factor, SREV2, which enhances LDL receptor synthesis. Uh, it turns out that it also enhances PCSK9 synthesis. There's very complicated regulation of uh, cholesterol metabolism uh, in the body and the liver. And when you use high dose statins, levels of PCSK9 go up. So there's a little bit of breaking of the statin effect uh, by uh, of the LDL lowering effect when you go to, uh, by PCSK9, which is increased in people on high dose of statins. So PCSK9 is a natural certain inhibitor of the other receptor, it targets the receptor for degradation, probably in cytosis. Uh, PCSK9 and other receptor genes are correlated by intracellular content statin treatment, and targeting PCSK9 uh, would be a logical approach based upon the genetic data. Uh, and so what, what's ended up happening, there's two major ways, and this is the, the nice thing about biotechnology is that, so you have now a, a gene of interest, and so what you wanna do, you've got a couple of approaches, so one of them is 
uh, you can make monoclonals to inhibit the protein, and it's specific for that protein. And this technology is one that was, when I was in medical school, it was quite a while ago, everything was gonna be monoclonals. And it, it just turns out the story was more complicated because you first had to get the right targets, then you had to go through the technology of, of humanized antibodies and fully human antibodies, and how do you scale them up? So it, it turned out to be difficult. It, it, uh, however, I had the benefit of receiving a monoclonal as part of a clinical trial when I had lymphoma in 2002. So progress does happen, and research makes an impact uh, with it. Uh, basically, if you target PCSK9, if we look at the time, of course, here, so here were the gain of function mutations, 2003. Uh, there was lots of animal work done here, the loss of function mutation. I showed it in the Eric study, 2006. And now it's 2015, and we have two drugs approved. So cardiovascular research, nothing has ever happened that fast in terms of first discovery to a product uh, with it. Now, it is, so it is exciting. Another, there's another, another approach that I'll show at the end that's also a big waste. So we have multiple antibodies. And there's large programs here. This is the Ali Bokumab Odyssey phase three lipid-lowering studies. Uh, these, the, the data on the phase two, phase three was presented to the FDA. This is the EVA Locumab program. Uh, and then there's the third program with Boku Sysimab uh, with it. Now, it does raise questions. Uh, so they're very efficacious. You lower LDL around 60% with the higher dosages. Uh, so there are obviously questions that we have reasonably good short-term safety data. Uh, what's the long-term safety profile? What will the impact of cardiovascular outcomes? Uh, you do not lower CRP with these drugs. And so you do increase other receptors. But remember, statins inhibit HMG core reductase. So that actually ends up affecting some other uh, Prenylated proteins, general general. So it, it, there are some other potential effects that statins may have on inflammation, gastrobiology, the uh, drug that works by a different mechanism, even though they both target the increasing other receptors, may not have. Uh, and ultimately, is you need to know some idea. You look at cost effectiveness, you need to look at both benefit and side effects and cost. So, what outcome studies are in progress. And I have to say, uh, one very nice thing is not only was going from discovery to approval of drug rapid, but the clinical trials outcome studies are far more robust than what we saw with the Zetamine. Thank goodness. Uh, that was really a, an example of uh, poorly done outcome studies. Because they only had one study, and they had these small little studies that didn't make any sense. So you have the Odyssey study, which is done people who've had a, an ACS event uh, with it. The Fourier study is a broader set of patients. They also have chronic CHD, they can have PAD or stroke. And then you end up having uh, the SPIRE trials, SPIRE 1 and 2. SPIRE uh, 1 and 2 have the broadest range. One of them is primary prevention and higher LDLs. So there's four outcome studies in progress. We do have some preliminary data that came out of the uh, earlier phase programs. This was, and you can see, uh, this is two different therapies. The results look pretty similar, don't they? Uh, both lower LDL very efficiently. There's sustained LDL reductions. And these were not outcome studies. These were safety studies, but if you look at the events, there was a benefit in both of these, and these were published simultaneously. Part of the reason that the FDA approved the drugs uh, with it, as I mentioned, the, the number of patients in these trials is quite large, and the first one that we'll finish will be, will be Fourier. The SPIRE 1 and 2 are still enrolling, uh, and if you have patients that you're uh, um, <coughs> having one to study, then contact me or uh, uh, our center. So here's what the indications are. Alirocumab is indicated as an adjunct to diet in maximally tolerated statin therapy for the treatment of adults with 
heterozygous family FH, or chromatids with right cardiac estrogenes, who require additional normability of cholesterol. Evil locomab indicates an endocrine diet. So basically the same thing plus homozygous FH. Because uh, they were studying so evil, loc oh, evil locomab and homozygous FH. Now, the drugs are expensive, and I would have you suggest that you carefully read the indication. Uh, but the drugs were not approved for statin tolerance. And so one of the things that comes up is, is you have to go through a prior authorization process. If you have a patient, you need good documentation in regards to why that's their maximally tolerated dose of statin. Uh, if you don't, you will not be approved uh, for it. So now, that's the nice thing about technology is other approaches besides monoclonals. And uh, you have antisense uh, and also siRNA. And one thing that's, that's happened recently is there has been, and, and it's a nice thing when you have really things that are more liver, both of those tend to go to the liver, but they, they recently had uh, some modifications of the delivery uh, so that it's more targeted to the liver. And this data was just presented at the ESC meeting, but you, what you can see is this is the effect in months of single doses. So this was an siRNA uh, with it, and now you're saying that you're seeing suppression of LDL for months uh, with one dose. Uh, monoclonals have a much shorter uh, duration of therapy, and very big drops in LDL cholesterol. This is multi-dosing, uh, where they put the doses were given infrequently. So it, it looks like you would be able to give a dose every three months to have sustained benefit. Now, I will point out, we have a lot more safety data with monoclonals than we do with siRNA uh, for it. Uh, there are, in addition, some large trials with CDTP inhibitors. Now, one of the genes that was listed in there in terms of having a reduction of CHT was CDTP, polymorphism is controversial with the genetics, but these inhibitors, that, that gene, that, that SNP, changed the HDL, it also changed the LDL levels. And these two therapies, evacetrovib and anacetrovib, both lower LDL around 30%. So if it's beneficial, it may have nothing to do with the HDL increase, but nonetheless, you would have an oral therapy, and if it reduces the vents, it reduces the vents. And we will have data on the first one in the summer of 2016, and the second one in the beginning of 2017. Uh, around sometime in 2017, we should hear the results of, of four year, the first PCSK9 study. So there'll be some exciting news in regards to alternative therapies uh, in terms of add-on lipid therapies that we'll be getting in the next uh, couple of years. Now, so what about triglycerides? So you know, HDL cholesterol is not very straightforward. And triglycerides, it turns out that if you look at genes involving triglyceride metabolism, uh, here is one with ApoC3. And there was a study done by the Amish. They were doing postprandial lipemia. They found that the Amish had uh, loss of function variant ApoC3. They had less postprandial lipemia. They also had lower calcium coronary calcium scores. So this ends up as the average study, along with all these initial BI cohorts and a bunch of other cohorts. Uh, basically, there were a rare loss of function variance. People who have this have very low triglycerides, uh, and they also have less heart disease. Now, they also have higher HDL, and they have lower EPOB, and they have you know, less small limbs LDL. So triglyceride is very tightly tied into many other changes in lipoprotein metabolism. But genes that are, play a role in the catabolism of these particles are frequently associated, and the majority are associated with coronary heart disease. So we're shifting back to genetics, are pointing out that that patient, so, and, and if you, and this goes back, there were some, Wolfgang and Joseph Pash were doing studies at the Methodist in, in the early 80s about postprandial lipemia in people with heart disease. And they found that people with heart disease, if you gave them a fat load, 
their triglycerides went higher and they stayed up longer than people without heart disease. And they have increased atherogenic ApoB containing particles in the postprandial state. It's there for like six to eight hours. So if you think about where do you, and there's Henry walked in just in time to try to Remember, remember, Wolfgang, Wolfgang and Joseph Patch talking about postprandial lipemia. Henry's done these, these studies also. But, so if you, if, you, if you have high triglycerides that are lasting for six to eight hours, so if you did it for breakfast, when's the next meal? Six, right, five, six hours later, and then the meal after that. So you're bathing your circulation in these triglycerides like the proteins, and they also show those people who have low levels of HDL cholesterol, and this may be why CDP is important, but essentially what ends up happening is so here's another target, APOC3. Now this has been an anti-sense approach. Uh, 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 and this was taking people who have familial uh, hypochondromia <laughs> syndrome. So these are really high triglycerides, as you can see. This is three, just three patients in 1,000, 2,000. But you, you, with the anti-sense, you inhibit the, uh, essentially the transcription, you never get the protein. And so you have a tremendous reduction in triglycerides. Uh, for that. APO little a is another target where we know what the LPA levels are genetically determined and by the Mendelian randomization, which is the type of, you look at who has the high, who has the gene with the high level versus the one with the low level. It's basically a natural randomization. What are the outcomes? It's associated with both CHD, stroke, also aortic stenosis. Uh, and this is also been targeted and you have huge reductions in LPA and that will be uh, so that will, those studies will be started later on, uh, probably later next year. year. Okay, okay, and there is a, uh, one other approach that's been starting phase three. And it, it turns, turns out uh, there's an enzyme, uh, uh, ATP citrate lyase, uh, which is important going from citrate to acetyl-CoA. And it was thought this would influence fatty acids and cholesterol. In humans, at least, the inhibitor that we've been testing is mostly working on the cholesterol side. Uh, and it turns out, bringing this up, it's another approach. Is this lowers, this is a trial that was, uh, we participated in, had statin intolerance, statin intolerance patients, but you lower LDL if these dosages are close to 30%. If you add azetamib in a statin intolerance patient, you're on a 50% reduction. So this might be another alternative in the future. It, it makes the safety part uh, for the statin tolerant patient, azetamide plus a, a, a drug. This is on statin being additive, giving you 50%. Okay, okay. So, so let me wrap up. up. Uh, it's an, I think, so the field of lipids has been one that's been uh, fascinating, and I showed you some of the successes. There have also been a large number of failures in terms of lipoproteins, inflammatory targets, and atherosclerosis. And there have been two large recent ones, uh, LPPLA2 inhibitors. Uh, so it turns out that we've done some of the work in terms of if you measure the, either the mass or activity of LPPLA2, there's a strong association with incident heart disease. However, if you look at the genetic variants, even though the gene that encodes the, uh, this enzyme is strongly associated with levels, it has no association with incident heart disease. And in fact, a loss of function variant offered no protection. Uh, and the same is true with secretory PLA2. So basically, the genetic data does not support that they're in the causal pathway. Uh, nonetheless, large trials were done. And the trials showed no benefit uh, in terms of CHD reduction. Actually, this one caused harm. So we have an example where the genetic data was negative. And in some trials, were also negative. Uh, there, it's, there are SNPs in this, uh, the, the gene that goes for HMP core reductase. They have very small effects on LDL cholesterol, but it's in the right direction. We know statins work. Azetamide, you saw the data. There's a loss of function variant, NPC1L1. It's rare. Uh, but there's also some common variants. And once again, the data supports that uh, it should be a good target. PCSK9 inhibitors, well, you saw the genetic data, it's very strong. You get very good LDL reduction. What will happen with outcome trials? I don't know, but we'll know pretty soon. 
CTP inhibitors, human genetic data is a little bit more controversial because in Japan there's a true loss of function variant and it's really not clear whether it's beneficial or not. There's, the epidemiology is not that good. There is good LDL reduction. We don't know what the answer is. I mentioned ETC 1002. We have no genetic data supporting this as a target. Uh, APOC3 antisense, APOA antisense, we have genetic data, uh, but we have, and this is the problem when you move into, you have to have safety and efficacy. So we're into novel therapies. You need to know what's the long-term safety on these drugs, and we simply don't know they're brand new therapies uh, for it. Okay, so in conclusion, statins reduce CD events in proportion to the amount of LDL reduction. <sighs> There's a considerable amount of risk, and probably risk for the LDL, even after people, someone has used a maximum tolerated statin. And I use that term, maximum tolerated statin. Uh, we could spend a long time talking about statin tolerance, but we've all seen patients who have a difficult time taking 80 milligrams of atorvastatin or 40 milligrams of suvastatin. They just feel miserable, and we've done some randomized trials, and yes, in a randomized trial, if you put people on placebo versus a drug, it's really kind of hard to show how much statin tolerance is real, but you can't, you know, I've never, when you take a medication, you, you, know, what, you know it's not, you know, you know what it is, you look at the pill, you gotta go buy the medicine, right? So someone sees they're taking a statin every day, and if they feel bad, they feel bad. If, and if they, if, they see, if they think it's a statin making them feel bad, I have no way of knowing that or not. I mean, this is really something where you can, we, we go through the whole process of trying multiple drugs, trying low doses, alternative day therapy, different pharmacology, and everything else. I think there could be some science in regards, there was a great paper in PNAS uh, where Tom Caskey looked at both exome sequencing and metabolomics, and he found there was one, one patient who uh, uh, had extraordinarily high levels of atorvastatin metabolites. They also complained of myalgias, and they were taking ginkgo, which inhi inhibits metabolism. So the most logical thing would actually be if we had statin for our patients, would be if we measured statin levels. Uh, that would make far more sense than trying to look at the genetics. But, and we're, we're doing a study where, with Amgen, uh, uh, with Evolocumab, we're hopefully we'll get that data in this soon and see if there's anything into that. Uh, so, but still, where we stand clinically is that you've got these people who, who have high LDLs on maximum solar statin, so there's a lot of people who might benefit. Um, um, they've had suboptimal response. Some people don't respond as well also. So I, I think human genetics uh, have shown a lot of promise in selecting targets for drug development, at least they have a better chance for success. You ultimately have to have an outcomes trial to understand not only the benefits, but also the risks of any therapy. Uh, and then the other issue comes up in terms of cost, really, of being cost effective. Uh, so we're, and I mentioned we're enrolling uh, trials for PCF and inhibitors and very high triglycerides with antisense APOC3. That's our phone number. Danielle, is that the right phone number? That's right. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> and that's, you can just email me. Fantastic. Dr. Ballantyne, thank you uh, for that tremendous overview and congratulations on your contribution to this body of work, which is more than palpable. Let's jump right into questions from the audience. Yeah, Neil. Yeah, so Christy, that, as expected, <laughs> So, as expected, that was fantastic. Um, and probably, you know, everybody here knows uh, I don't believe in guidelines. But I've got to say the guidelines have, you know, they've got to say, it's still a little bit like driving south on 59 and seeing the speed limit change every five miles. Uh, but here's the thing. For those of us who are interventionalists, for example, things are really straightforward. People we see have always had a problem. And by the time they get to us, it's usually a pretty bad problem or a series of bad problems. So, you know, what their risk categorization is, how long we should drive things is pretty straightforward. For us, that part's usually a no-brainer. The thing that we struggle with uh, are kids in their early 20s, women who uh, want to have children at some point, what do we do with those patients when, when there's an indication for therapy? 
Yeah, so, and I think that's the, the hardest part is that if you use any of these, first of all, there was a lot of controversy about the risk calculator, and they were saying, well, it overcalculates risk. I, I don't find that a controversy uh, with it. What we have been doing is we've been telling people, we've been giving to people a Framingham risk score with ATP3. So if you have a, let's say, a 40-year-old woman, and you use the old ATP3 calculator, they're all low risk. I mean, even if they have high LDL and a high blood pressure, their 10-year risk is gonna be low. In the ERIC study, we had 16,000 people. Uh, and if you looked at the people in whom you'd be doing the risk score, half were women, 8,000 women that are aged 45 to 65, you only had 2% who were not low risk. Well, you know, we have had a lot of events in there. And, and so that it, it's a problem. Now, when, with, with the new risk calculator, they added stroke as an outcome, which is... Our, our, our dilemma is not 40-year-old. So, 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 so what ends up happening is, is it still ends up is if you add stroke as an outcome, you're leaving out REVASC. REVASC is not an outcome. So if we, I'm just going to go, if you look at the Eric study, revascularization was more common than the MI. So you're telling somebody, I got a, you got a 5% risk, but you're leaving out something that's more common than the MI. You're leaving out heart failure, which later on in life is still more common than the MI. So you know, you're giving people a risk of 5%, where if, if that individual's real risk if you throw in revascularization, instant heart failure hospitalization, it might be 15%. So you've got to first of all say, why are we giving people the number which is much lower than their real number for having something bad happen in terms of cardiovascular, nor do we count their risk for diabetes, which might be 40%. So one of the things they did put in the is that if your LDL is over 190, you don't do a risk score. If someone has a high LDL, and they made it simple because diagnosing FH using the Simon Broom criteria or something else is really complicated. But if, so the first thing that comes up, if you've got a young woman and her LDL is 210, you don't need anything else. That's indication of treat. So high LDL. Now, they also mentioned in there, well, sometimes you don't even have to be in there, sorry, 190. What if they have really bad family history and your LDL is 160 to 190, but it's really a bad family history? Then it's kind of, you get into your clinical judgment, I think, sometimes, what are you gonna do? I think high, having bad family histories where ordering a lipoprotein little A is useful, because sometimes that will be the trigger that might do that. If they're young, you have to discuss pregnancy. And so, you know, people, stats are contraindicated during pregnancy, and so you have the issue of using oral contraception or some type of contraception in that. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of controversy in diabetes. Why they put age 40 to 75? I mean, what about someone who's 25 or 30 years old and they've got diabetes and bad lipids. Uh, I think you can make an argument. All the data suggests that treating early in life is easier. You, you don't have to treat as aggressively. You can use a lower dose. If you get it down earlier in life, you're gonna have a prolonged benefit. But, you know, but I think that issue that comes up is, I don't know why you're just talking about young women. What about young men? I mean, you know, because, I, I yeah, because what ends up, no, because it ends up, that's the group that doesn't even see a doctor, you know. Uh, you get, like from 18 to 35 years old, that they don't, you know, they don't see anybody. Yeah, they don't. Well, first I'd like to comment, I'm pleased to hear that Neil even notices the speed limits on 59. <laughs> <laughs> so the glasses, it's good. <laughs> very good. It was a very nice overview, uh, Christy. The question I have is on the siRNA uh, use. You know, in the lab we're using it, we have to administer it directly to the cells that last two or three days. We have to re-administer it. You're getting two and three months, and the question is, how are you administering this? So, so no, it's, 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 it's subcutaneous uh, administration. So there's basically Galmac is there. There's a, uh, it's a modification where you're, you're looking at a uh, carbohydrate uh, that ends up being binding to a receptor from the liver. So it, it, it greatly increases delivery to the liver. Uh, and that's only useful if it's a, if you're targeting the liver. You're targeting some other, you know, you're trying to target the pancreas or autumn cells, you're not gonna, it's not gonna work uh, with it. But it happens to work for the liver. So that's been both siRNA and I, the next generation of antisense will be quite different because you'll be able to, the, 
Antisense does, so antisense has some problems in that there's been flu-like syndromes and injection site reactions and, you know, it's, it's, it looks to be dose dependent, but there is an immunological response. And so if you use a lower dose, you can avoid a lot of that uh, with it. But you'd have to, there, there needs to be probably some kind of way of enhancing specific targeting to the cell type. Uh, otherwise, it's probably not going to work in that way. Christy, thanks for a, a wonderful presentation. Where does uh, calcium scoring fit in your algorithm and uh, a story on CRP? Where are we there? So, you know, I think there's, there is the issue of risk assessment is important. And so calcium scoring fits in in two ways. Now, unfortunately, Neil talked about you know, people in their 20s and 30s. And calcium scoring is, in general, not useful. So if it's a man less than 40, the problem with calcium scoring is that he may have a zero score and have lots of soft plaque. Uh, so I don't recommend calcium scoring in a man less than 40 or a woman less than 50, because you're giving false reassurance. Now, paradoxically, in older individuals, uh, it ends up that you know, we get referred a number of people and particularly some women who can be in their 60s, and men who are having terrible problems with statins, and it's all primary prevention. And you know, I've done calcium scores and had a, a number of zeros come back. At which point, if someone's, if a woman is 66 years old, and and it, these people very commonly don't actually have the clustering of risk factors, they just have a high LDL. So I think you can actually downgrade somebody and say, look, you know, there's really no need to be using a high dose of statin. You've got a zero calcium score. Your blood pressure is fine. You don't have diabetes. Yes, you have a high LDL. We do know that there are some people, even with that face, they have high LDLs. They don't get disease. And we know that calcium scoring is better than any single parameter that we measure in terms of risk assessment. So I think you can use calcium scoring to you know, decide in the right patient population when to treat and sometimes when to be less aggressive uh, in, in older people, it can be helpful. Younger people, you can be, you can, it can have, it can be something that confuses the situation with a younger person because they may say, oh, I don't have to worry. Well, no, you, you know, it's just, fact is, you have, may have a ton of soft plaque in there uh, for it. CRP is the same type of a thing. If someone has a high level of CRP, there's some increase in risk uh, for that. So I, it's, it's not, unfortunately, CRP is a, it's, it's, it's a, a, you know, hopefully we'll get some better biomarkers than CRP. Uh, it's, it's not specific, it bounces around when you get an infection. It's, there are people that if you have a sustained high CRP level though, you are having increased risk. And so we know that in Jupiter, it was done with people with elevated CRPs uh, with it. So statins do work in people with who high C would have high CRP. And, uh, and we don't know if it's low, we don't know if lowering CRP is important or not. Uh, it's not the way the study was designed. Last, last comment and question. It's reassuring the guidelines are getting easier, but for some patients this is quite complex, especially when you overlap Gen X. The lipid metabolism and atherosclerosis clinic, who are you seeing and who do you want to see? Uh, so we, we see people who have difficult to treat lipid disorders, uh, and, some, and people who also have, you know, you get people who have atherosclerosis that is much worse than you'd expect. Uh, they just, for whatever reason, is progressive uh, with it. So, it, and it. so basically, it is the lipid metabolism, atherosclerosis. So basically, those are the two most common things. Uh, and we are uh, just, on, just this close to being finally have worked out, hopefully, that we can be able to get, get people affordable genetic testing. So right, that would end up being uh, uh, sequencing uh, for specific mutations. And then for certain families now, you, exome sequencing is a reality. You can do looking at it if, if there's a bad, very bad family history uh, with that. It's an area that we're interested in. It's been a problem to uh, uh, have something that's affordable and people don't get stuck with ridiculous bills. Uh, they promise us that, that we're, we're right there, but they, they have heard that promise before. But uh, the Bayer Genetics has, a, has been something was bought by some Japanese thing, and there's yeah. they're supposedly they're supposedly they're supposedly we're going to have a test for FH that's not going to be expensive, and then they'll have 
assistance in terms of, so the patient doesn't get stuck with some huge bill for exome sequencing. Uh, right now it's been more talk than customer service, but. Okay, thanks.